five strange mysteries from Ohio. Being the seventh most populated state in the U.S., Ohio is composed of rolling plains and bordered by Lake Erie to the north. It's hard not to fall in love with both the city and its countryside, but like any other state, Ohio isn't without its share of weird stories. Here are five strange mysteries from Ohio. Number five, harassment of Bill and Dorothy Wacker. For elderly couple Bill and Dorothy Wacker of Stark County, Ohio, life seemed normal. For 48 years of marriage, they lived a quiet, unassuming life in their small town. But little did they know, it was all going to get turned upside down. It started in 1984 when a series of break-ins plagued the couple. They took it in stride though and didn't report it to police. But a third break-in in January of 1985 finally drove them to tell the cops. Then in July, Dorothy was home alone. She was recovering from heart surgery when she heard a knock at the door. She didn't know the visitor, but allowed him inside because he asked to use the phone after his car had broken down. After the man made the call and said goodbye, Dorothy thought he had left, but he actually stayed inside the house. The man then snuck up behind her and knocked her out cold with a blow to the head. When she woke up, she was bound and gagged on the kitchen floor. Miraculously, she managed to crawl out an open window and let the neighbors know and they ended up calling the police. Although Dorothy wasn't seriously injured, Bill later took stock of the items in the home and found a 22 caliber revolver, a movie camera, radio scanner, and antique watch was missing. Right in their living room was a message that said, cheaper, but will do. The baffling thing is that the stolen objects were then returned to their home. Four months after the initial assault, the revolver was found on the front porch, then the other items were returned one by one. But the harassment was just starting. They would soon begin receiving phone calls. The caller would often threaten them, but other times there was nothing but heavy breathing on the line. Despite changing their numbers several times, the calls kept coming. On October 27, 1993, Dorothy was attacked again. This time, she suffered skull lacerations. Although police searched the neighborhood and various residents in the area, they came up with nothing. By this point, Bill decided to take matters into his own hands and got family members to do a stakeout. Even though the family spread out in groups, they weren't able to catch anyone. After deciding to call it quits, they heard thumping sounds on the porch, and it was here they found a note from the harasser saying, Get the message. It seems the stalker had found a blind spot in their stakeout. For years, the identity of the stalker and the one who attacked Dorothy remained a mystery. Police released an initial composite sketch of a possible suspect, but this didn't generate any helpful leads. They described the man as being in his mid-20s in 1985, with blonde hair and blue eyes standing about 5 feet 9 inches tall. No fingerprints were found on the message, and police believe the suspect was using his non-dominant writing hand to write the message. However, for the second attack on Dorothy, police began to suspect Bill as the harasser. They reasoned because of the intimacy with the whacker's routine and habits, it was possible whoever the suspect was could be a neighbor, friend, or family member. As unusual as it started, the harassment suddenly stopped. Even after Bill and Dorothy passed away, the case has remained unsolved. Number four, Cynthia Anderson. For an entire year, Cynthia Anderson, known as Cindy, from Toledo, Ohio, complained about her bizarre and frightening dreams. She repeatedly told her mother how she had dreams of being abducted from her home and then murdered by a complete stranger. But her mother ignored it. After all, how often do dreams really come true? It was August 4, 1981, and Cindy was working at a legal office as a secretary. In the mornings, she was often alone at work and made a habit to lock the doors. By 12 noon, two co-workers arrived, but they found the office door locked. When they got inside, it was empty. Cindy wasn't around, but mail was at the front door. The radio was on, and the lights in AC were also turned on. Normally, whenever Cindy left the office, she would place the phones on hold, but this wasn't done. They looked around for her, 
Jim, one of her co-workers, said he found a romance novel Cindy was reading left open to the only violent scene in the story. It was about a woman being abducted at knife point. Cindy was then reported missing, and police searched the office for clues. Nothing was missing, though, inside the office except for Cindy's car keys and her purse. Everything else was left undisturbed. According to her family, there was no reason for Cindy to disappear on her own. In fact, she was getting ready to actually quit her job in two weeks so she could attend a Bible college with her boyfriend, and she had expressed excitement over it. But her father did notice his daughter seemed to be paying more attention to her face and was dieting. He likened her to a debutante, which he believes may have caused part of her disappearance. After she went missing, one client, Larry Mullins, came forward and said one time while he was in the office paying a legal fee, Cindy received a phone call. He said she hung up the call real quick, as if the caller on the other line said something obscene. He says he clearly remembered the look on Cindy's face after the call. It was one of terror. She was scared of something. During investigations, police discovered someone had written down, I love you, Cindy, GW, right on the wall near the office. Cindy had noticed it 10 months before she disappeared. It was covered up, but weeks later it appeared again. It was unclear whether this had anything to do with her disappearance or not. A month after Cindy went missing in September of 1981, police received a phone call from an anonymous woman. She said Cindy was being held against her will inside a basement. She hinted it was a house owned side by side by the same family. The problem though was that the tipster never gave an address. She then hung up when investigators asked for more information. She called again, but when an investigator tried to listen in, she hung up again and never called back. It's unclear whether the tip was ever serious. Later on, Cindy's disappearance was tied to a case about drug trafficking. Apparently, nine people were arrested and one of them was linked to Cindy. His name was Jose Rodriguez Jr. and he became a suspect because he was once represented by Richard Neller, Cindy's employer. In 1995, Rodriguez was on trial and a witness testified Rodriguez had abducted Cindy to send a message to Neller that he was inadequately representing him. This remains to be speculation though, and no direct links have ever been found. Cindy's case has never been solved. Both Cindy's father and mother have passed away since, without knowing whatever actually happened to their daughter. Number 3. Amy Maheljevic Amy Maheljevic was a sweet 10-year-old girl. And on October 27, 1989, she was home alone when someone called her house. Whoever called that day, no one knows. One thing's for sure though, whoever it was, the person convinced Amy to meet up with them at a nearby shopping center to buy a gift for Amy's mother. The caller said Amy's mom had received a promotion and deserved a present. Amy made her way to the shopping center and several friends and people saw her talking to an unknown man close to the barber shop at the Bay Village Square. Two 10-year-olds who were classmates of Amy also said they saw her talking to a man. They gave a description of what he looked like and the sketch was later distributed. When Amy was reported missing, everyone in town became on edge and during Halloween of that year, everyone kept an eye out on their children. Despite a solid investigation and thorough search for the young girl though, she was nowhere to be found. Then on February 8, 1990, a young girl's body was discovered in a field. It was Amy. Her body was dumped off County Road 1181 in rural Ashland County, Ohio. Forensic evidence was collected around the crime scene. This included mitochondrial DNA. There were also various fibers collected from her body and the items found with her. During the autopsy, it was determined Amy had eaten some sort of soy substance prior to her death. She was found in her underwear, and it's believed she was sexually assaulted prior to being killed. Her killer also took several items from her, including her denim backpack, earrings, and a binder. When police investigated thoroughly, they learned several other young girls had received similar phone calls weeks prior to Amy's abduction. The male caller said the same thing to those girls, enticing them to meet with him to buy a present for their mothers. This finding was crucial since some of the girls had unlisted numbers. Investigators traced one common ground the girls had 
and they had all visited Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, which had a visitor's logbook. The girls may have signed it, adding their phone numbers and addresses. Several suspects were investigated and DNA samples collected, but by 2019, police said after conducting a thorough search of each suspect on their list, they say the killer was likely not on it. Today, the case of Amy Mihaljevic remains unsolved. Police consider the case open, and they are continuing to follow leads and gather new suspects. Number 2. Circleville Letters A small, gentle town, Circleville, Ohio, is a quiet community. It's not exactly the type of place where you would chase a big story, but in 1976, it became the center of attention for some strange happenings. Residents in the town mysteriously began receiving letters. These letters were threatening in nature, often written in block capital letters with unnatural formations, making them feel urgent and sinister. What's unusual is that the letters contained a reference to the personal circumstances of the receiver, most of them too personal for anyone else to know. Mary Gillespie, one of the letter receivers, was told her home was under surveillance. She was also accused of having an affair with the school superintendent where Gillespie worked as a bus driver. Her husband, Ron, also received a letter, but by this time, the rumors about Mary's supposed affair had spread all across the small town. Ron suspected it was his brother-in-law, Paul Freshour, who was sending the letters. They tried to catch him, and for a time, the letters did stop, but on August 19, 1977, Ron received a phone call. He left the house in a rage and took a gun with him, but later he was found dead having crashed his car. The gun he took was fired, but who or what he fired at, nobody knows. Even more sinister, his blood alcohol was over 1.5 times the legal limit, very unusual for Ron, who was deemed a non-drinker. Eventually, Mary admitted to the affair, hoping for things to end, but then various Circleville residents began receiving letters from the same hand. These letters called for a more thorough investigation into Ron's death. The Gillespie family, along with various elected officials, began receiving new letters. They were still vulgar, intimidating, and threatening. The main suspect was still Paul Freshour, but Paul vehemently denied being involved. Then in 1983, signs all over the town appeared. This time, they targeted the Gillespie's daughter. There was even a booby-trapped pistol that almost killed her when a box was sent to her. The good thing is that the mechanism didn't fire. The gun loaded was traced to Fresh Hour, but he said the pistol had been missing for some time. Eventually, being the only suspect, Fresh Hour was taken into custody. Handwriting analysis said the handwriting was close enough and added evidence saw him sentenced to 25 years in jail. But strangely, the letters didn't stop even when he was imprisoned. Police investigations revealed that the letters had come from Columbus, not even Circleville. By this time, people and police began to question Fresh Hour's involvement, especially when he received his own letter in prison as well. That letter to him read, Now when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? Even Unsolved Mysteries was sent a letter from the supposed Circleville writer insisting they stay away from the story and the case. Whether Fresh Hour was the culprit, or an accomplice, or another victim continues to remain unanswered. Up until his death in 2012, he maintained his innocence, and still to this day, no one knows the identity of the Circleville writer. Number 1. Strange Northeast Ohio Approximately 5,000 unsolved cases are distributed throughout Ohio, but some parts of the state do have a more mysterious number of cold cases and people can't help but wonder why. In Northeast Ohio, there's currently more than 20 unsolved murders. While there have been countless high-profile cases from the state, some already solved, there are so many others that continue to churn out more questions than answers. Some of the most baffling murder cases date back from decades before, as far back as 1951 in Cleveland, where 10-year-old Beverly Potts was taken while she was heading home from watching a show at a park one night. While she was normally not allowed to head to the park at night, 
That particular evening was special since there was a celebration. Lots of people were there and Beverly was allowed to stay out longer. Witnesses reported seeing little girl talking to two men in a car around 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. right about the time she was heading home. But no one saw her being taken. Many believe Potts may have been killed soon after she was taken and buried in someone's home in the area. However, an attempt at looking for her body turned up empty. An unusual letter was later sent to police in 2001, supposedly from a suspect confessing to killing Potts. However, this was later determined to be a hoax. Then, on December 15, 1982, 14-year-old Sonia Green was last seen walking to school close to her East Cleveland home. Sonia was abducted, then brutally assaulted before being left to die by a snowbank. A week after her murder, Annette Lawrence's body was found inside the trunk of her car in the same area where Sonia was attacked and killed. Both cases remain unsolved, but it's believed they both share the same killer. Police say they do have DNA evidence from the cases and are hoping to catch a break in the case as technology advances. It's not just girls that have disappeared or have been found murdered, but also several males. In 2011, 20-year-old Brandon Cartalone was found dead inside his apartment. His feet and hands were bound. Brandon was studying at the Cleveland Institute of Art and was running a small pop business, which may have contributed to his death. He was found with a gash on his abdomen and had been strangled to death. At 57, Joseph Mullins was reported missing in December of 2014 in Mantua Township. For days, no one was able to find him, but blood was discovered in his detached garage as well as on his bedspread. His body was then found 10 days after he was reported missing in the warehouse district in downtown. These cases and so many more in Northeast Ohio remain unsolved today and many more being added each year. In 2018 alone, there are hundreds of murder cases, some of them solved, but many of them still have no suspects or leads. So there were five strange mysteries from Ohio. Ohio might be one of the many states in America, but it has its own mark and personality. Above all, it has its fair share of strange mysteries to go with it. If you enjoyed this video, then please remember to subscribe to our channel. We have new videos coming out every Wednesday and Saturday we know you'll love. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.